we're going to see ICP issues in many environments. In the emergency department, we're mostly going to see it with TBI, intracerebral hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage. But look at this. It's a large differential. We could see it with almost anything. But in the emergent cases, we're typically going to be looking at TBI and ICH. Now, intracranial pressure is really important. And we need to understand both the mechanisms of it, what's causing it, and how we treat it best. The first thing to understand is it's all about the cerebral perfusion pressure. Because as the ICP goes up, the mean arterial pressure has to go up to meet it in order to keep the cerebral perfusion pressure happy. And that's the key because there's a limited space in the skull. And when you have something like a bleed or edema or traumatic brain injury, intracerebral hemorrhage going on, you need to preserve CPP. And that's best done through ICP. The problem is, we don't have a ventriculostomy in for most of our patients in the emergency department, so we don't know what that ICP level is. But we know that there's something brewing because we've put together the history, the physical exam, the neuro exam, and we're figuring out that there's a CNS problem going on and we need to pay attention to ICP. So let's talk about how to treat that. It's a simple tiered process starting off with simple stuff and getting more complicated. The first thing is the assessment. Do a good job of getting history and physical neuro exam and put that together and try to figure out what's really going on here because each different diagnosis may have a different benefit from the therapeutics that we apply. There's differences if we're talking about traumatic brain injury versus subarachnoid hemorrhage or intracerebral hemorrhage. So you could have this subarachnoid hemorrhage with hydrocephalus. That patient's going to do well, improve their outcome if they get a ventriculostomy and drain the CSF. That's key for subarachnoid hemorrhage. Or you could have this young tree climber with a subdural hemorrhage and look at those ventricles. Ventriculostomy is not going to be what helps him right now. It's probably going to be a craniectomy. But in the meantime, we're dealing with ICP. And ICP is a generic concept. And we do have some guidelines, and the guidelines are really extrapolated from the TBI literature for the most part, but there's significant differences in the pathophysiology of many disease states. For instance, mannitol might be beneficial for TBI, but in subarachnoid hemorrhage, it risks hypotension, hypovolemia, and that's bad for subarachnoid hemorrhage if you risk causing or allowing vasospasm. A ventriculostomy, as we just saw, may be good in one case, but not in the other. Even talking about things like steroids, we don't give steroids in TBI, but we're starting to talk about them with subarachnoid hemorrhage. The more we think about the pathophysiology of what's going on, the better we'll be able to match our therapeutics to how to best help the patient. So let's start with the first tier. It's the simple stuff. When you walk in a room and the patient you know has a CNS problem, get the head of the bed up unless there's some compelling reason not to. You're allowing blood flow to egress from that skull by the jugular system and buying space. It's all about the real estate. The second thing is my favorite. It's analgesia. Now, anybody with blood in their head or edema or these severe headaches, they're going to have pain. So give them something for pain because we know that pain increases the cerebral metabolic rate and it's going to increase ICP too. So give them a little touch of fentanyl. Put them on a fentanyl infusion. It's fast acting, easy titratable. There's no reason to not give a fentanyl infusion in most cases. And you can even do your exam with a fentanyl infusion going on. Now, it's going to provide a little bit of sedating effect. It's not a sedating agent. But it might su it supply a little bit, but maybe you need true sedation. Think about Versed, which is short acting. That can be a bolus or an infusion. Steering clear a little bit from propofol, unless I really know what my ICP numbers are and where I want my blood pressure to go. But think about dexmedetomidine. We're starting to use that more and more. It, along with atomidate, are very blood pressure neutral agents, especially if your patient is intubated. 
These are great agents. I start decks without a bolus and start it low and titrate up. And it's really given me very little problems. And then osmotic therapy. We've got great results with osmotic therapy, mannitol and hypertonic saline, the sugar or the salt. Both of these act in a similar fashion. They're creating an osmotic gradient. And that gradient is pulling the fluid from the brain's parenchyma and interstitial tissue into the vasculature and dumping it out the kidneys. We've been giving mannitol for decades, and it's a really nice agent. It works well. There are some downsides to it, though, especially if you're thinking about traumatic brain injury, because you can risk too much diuresis and bringing the blood pressure down. So be attentive to the blood pressure, be attentive to fluid status when you're giving mannitol. The other agent is hypertonic saline. It's the sodium cousin of mannitol. It's really a nice agent that many of us are going to. It comes in multiple flavors, 3%, 7.5%, 23% bullets. And it does the same thing. It creates this osmotic gradient. And it's very nice, in, uh, as opposed to mannitol, it's nice because it is a volume expander. So especially if you've got somebody whose blood pressure you're worried about and you don't want it to drop, think about hypertonic saline. It will not be as diuresis worthy and as blood pressure dropping as the mannitol will. But both of them, they've been studied a bunch of times. There's not great data favoring one over the other. Many of us like hypertonic saline better because it tends to last a little bit longer and it is a volume expander. So one thing about osmotic therapy that if you've got a patient that you're hanging on to for a long time in the ED because they're boarding or oh, you're getting into hours of taking care of these patients is some people like to use both mannitol and hypertonic saline and in infusions and slowly driving up either the sodium level or the osmolarity. I'm not a big fan of that because if we think about the concept of the gradient, let's take hypertonic saline. If I start an infusion and slowly, gradually drive the sodium up to 155, the brain is acting along with that. It notices that, that the sodium, the osmolarity is changing and it changes the milieu. So by the time you get up to 155, which can happen in a day or so, now you've lost your osmotic pull. You don't have a tool to use. So my preference is using mannitol and or hypertonic saline in bolus dosing. With my really sick patients with ICP, I'm giving a dose of mannitol. And then the next time the ICP goes up, I'm giving a dose of hypertonic saline and I'm alternating. That way, I'm not increasing either the osmolarity or the sodium levels very quickly, and I have more bang for my buck. Now, we know that fever is bad. Treat that fever in all neuro patients, full stop. But what about hypothermia? We've dabbled with hypothermia with ICP. We do know that therapeutic hypothermia can decrease ICP. And we've tried to make it work in things like traumatic brain injury. We're trying to make it work in subarachnoid hemorrhage, severe ICP patients. But it hasn't quite worked. And the thinking about that is that the relationship of cerebral metabolism and cerebral blood flow are uncoupled with hypothermia. So there's then a disproportionate decrease in cerebral blood flow. So while it may decrease the ICP, Then there's the side effects of cerebral hypoperfusion and affinity for oxygen. So we think this is why it's not quite working for outcomes. So no no therapeutic hypothermia. But now we're getting toward the end of our simple stuff. Let's go to tier two. Now we're digging in, getting a little more invasive. If you're at this point, you're probably thinking about a ventriculostomy. Now who gets a ventriculostomy? In TBI, it's the patients who have a GCS of three to eight and a really bad-looking CT. If the CT doesn't look so bad, remember it could be some other kind of brain injury, diffuse axonal injury, but if they're posturing or they have a bad exam, they're going to benefit from a ventriculostomy too. And that's a good diagnosis tool because now you've got a number, but it's also good because you can drain CSF and really improve that number quickly. So thinking about a ventriculostomy, 
Phasoactive agents are sometimes really helpful. They're on the table. If you have numbers and ICP goals, and for TBI, ICB goal is now less than 22. And we typically run that way with subarachnoid hemorrhage as well. But with vasoactives, if my ICP is rising, I want my MAP to rise. So I may even put on a phenylephrine drip to increase my mean arterial pressure to match that ICP so that I'm maintaining cerebral perfusion pressure. It's all in the mechanics of it. I know dilators are useful in subarachnoid hemorrhage patients where we're trying to keep the blood pressure up to prevent vasospasm, but we're also trying to decrease the risk of ICP. So an inodilator like milrinone will vasodilate to allow the perfusion, the cerebral perfusion pressure to keep those vessels open and help to prevent them from vasospasming, but also decrease the ICP. Not typically something we see used in the emergency department, but paralytics. Now, paralytics are great. If you've got an intubated patient and a ventriculostomy and a number, and you've tried much of everything else, give 10 of vecuronium, give 100 of rocuronium. Watch the ICP come down. You're paralyzing, taking away the tone in the entire body. It is really very useful. And sometimes we even put somebody on a paralytic infusion. Now, hyperventilation, we're getting toward the end of tier two. And hyperventilation has some caveats. Yeah, hyperventilation is very effective. It will blow off CO2 and it'll cause vasoconstriction and buy you some real estate in that skull. But you only want to do it if you have a pop-off valve. If you've got that ventriculostomy that you can drain CSF with, that's good. Or if you're going to the OR for a craniectomy, now's the time to hyperventilate. Blow that CO2 down to 25 or 30, and that will buy you some more time. Hyperventilation really is when you're on your way to tier three. Because if you hyperventilate for a long time, you're going to have an issue where the brain adjusts to that new pH and it vasodilates. And if you don't have a pop off valve, the brain's going to be in trouble. So here we are at tier three. It's the kitchen sink. We've talked about therapeutic hypothermia. Not so great. What about birth suppression with barbiturate like phenobarbital? That really is an option and it will calm down the tone, but it comes with a price. The price is that you have side effects of decreased GI, decreased cardiac, decreased respiratory, metabolic derangements, it really can be quite challenging to deal with. So birth suppression, kitchen sink, if you're trying that, you're really getting toward the end. And of course, the craniectomy, it's the mechanical answer. We've got too much pressure, let's take the cap off and allow that pressure to expand. It's a great tool used in certain instances. Young people with severe TBI, maybe not older people, maybe not people who have already severe damage. Now, if you're thinking about the brain as a compartment and the whole body with respect to compartment syndrome, there have been cases where an abdominal X-lap has decreased the pressure in the abdomen that helps offload pressure in the compartment of the brain. And that really is the tier three ultimate. So we've got three tiers, one, two, and three. It's an easy walkthrough. And you should know what your tools are. The first thing, though, to really think about is to do something, but think about the mechanism. What are you dealing with? So, Haney, if the ICP issues got you down, just do something. And here are the things you can do. Start simple, tier one, head a bed up, analgesia, maybe sedation, osmotics, and then move on to your more invasive maneuvers. Thank you. Thank you.